Hello, Namaskar. This is First Post and you're watching Vantage with me, Palki Sharma. We begin with a big success for the Indian Navy. They've thwarted the hijacking of a ship and rescued it with 15 Indian sailors on board. We'll bring you the full story and the continuing challenges and risks on the high seas. Meanwhile, another conflict threatens West Asia, Iran versus the ISIS. The terror group has claimed responsibility for the blasts that killed more than 80 Iranians. On the other side of Asia, the Korean Peninsula is on the edge. The North fired 200 shells. The South evacuated islands. In Bangladesh, the army has been deployed for the Sunday election. The opposition is boycotting it. In Myanmar, India and China find themselves on the same side for a change. We'll explain. In Nepal, new deals with India prove that they can work together despite differences. In South Africa, Blade Runner Oscar, Oscar Pistorius walks out on parole after nine years. In Nigeria, they're banning university degrees from neighboring countries. Also, the debate on reclining seats on airplanes. Why are they vanishing? And what's the lipstick index? How the slowdown is boosting the market for little affordable luxuries. All this and more coming up. The headlines first. The US claims Russia is using North Korean missiles in Ukraine, but no confirmation from Kiev. Washington also fears that Moscow is seeking ballistic missiles from Iran. In the last few days, Russia has unleashed a barrage of aerial attacks on Ukraine. Will elections in Pakistan be delayed again? The upper house of parliament passes a resolution seeking a delay, citing security concerns. But only 14 out of the total 100 members were present during this session. Pakistan is scheduled to go to polls on the 8th of February. China's property crisis claims a new victim, shadow banking giant Zhongzhe, files for bankruptcy. In November, authorities had opened criminal investigations against this group. During China's real estate boom, many developers used Zhongzhe to finance their projects. New year, new problems for Tesla. It recalls more than 1.6 million electric vehicles in China to fix its steering software. This is a fresh blow to the Elon Musk-owned company. This recall comes just days after China's BYD surpassed Tesla in EV sales. India and Mauritius will jointly develop a small satellite. The Modi government greenlights the agreement inked late last year. ISRO will launch the satellite in 2025. Space cooperation between India and Mauritius dates back to the 1980s. And now you can send your name to the moon. NASA is offering the public the chance to do so on its next moon mission. The rover will carry the names of millions who will be given a souvenir boarding pass. Another day, another hijacking and once again, the Indian Navy to the rescue. It was a very dangerous mission, a maritime chase, a commando operation and finally a daring rescue. It's a big success for the Indian Navy. They've successfully thwarted a hijacking attempt. They have cemented their role as first responders in the Indian Ocean. But how did this operation pan out? Well, here's what we know. On Thursday evening, the Indian Navy received a message, sort of like a distress call. It came from a Liberia flagged ship near Somalia, a ship called MV Leela Norfolk. And what did the message say? That five or six armed men had boarded their ship. Clearly a hijacking attempt. So the Navy sprung to action. First, a patrol aircraft was dispatched. This morning, it reached the hijacking site. It established contact with the vessel. Then a warship was deployed, the Indian Navy's INS Chennai. It reached the hijacked vessel around evening today. And once there, Indian commandos took over. They boarded the ship. They secured the 21 crew members. And finally, they sanitized the vessel. In other words, they tried to clear out the pirates. Didn't have to, though. Turns out the hijackers fled the vessel. The Navy says their warnings probably made them flee. So the ship and the crew is safe. In fact, 15 of those crewmen were Indian. I guess that was added mot motivation for the Navy. They've released footage of this operation. Take a look.
Now, usually these hijackings follow a set pattern. Take control, sail to a safe port, then seek ransom. But who was behind this hijacking attempt? Looks like Somali pirates. Last month, they hijacked a Malta flagged ship. It was called MV Ruin. Even then, the Indian Navy was the first responder. Another possibility is the Houthi rebels, though highly unlikely at this point, because most of their operations have focused on attacking ships. Hijacking is not their MO. We've also done some digging on the Leela Norfolk. It was sailing from Brazil to Bahrain. In that case, it doesn't really need the Red Sea. It can sail through the Persian Gulf. So right now, Somali pirates are the top suspects, not the Houthis of Yemen. If you think that that's better, it's not. Somali pirates were active in the last two decades, and they were a real headache. In 2011 alone, they attacked some 212 ships. They cost the global economy $18 billion a year. But in 2019, they sort of disappeared. We had more naval patrols, more joint operations. Also, the government in Somalia had cracked down. And this was the result. The pirates disappeared. But why are they back now? Because of the Red Sea situation. It's classic criminal mentality. You see the crime rate shoot up, you join. It's a major, major concern for shipping perhaps even bigger than the Houthis. Just think about it. The Houthis may stop if the Gaza war ends, but the pirates probably would not. It may require another multinational effort. So to recap, the Indian Ocean has two security challenges now. The Houthis in the Red Sea and the pirates in the Arabian Sea. It's a double whammy for India because around 20% of our trade passes through this region. This security minefield, 20% of India's trade, as a result, costs are rising. Insurers are charging more, the crew is charging more. Reports say overall rates could be 30 to 40% higher. So New Delhi is weighing some changes. It is looking to subsidize Indian exports, basically offset the rising costs. The government has already said rice exports have been affected. Next could be fruits, vegetables, and garments. So clearly there is a concern. But subsidies alone would not address that, which is why India has deployed warships. Three of them are already in the region, INS Mormugao, INS Kochi, and INS Kolkata. All three are guided missile destroyers. Now a fourth has arrived there, INS Chennai. And these are very powerful ships. They can launch missiles, they can battle submarines, they can also move in stealth. Now, to give you some context, the U.S. has only deployed three warships in the Red Sea. India has four in the Indian Ocean. Tells you how serious the threat is. Of course, it's not a new role for India. As the defense minister said recently, India is the region's net security provider, and in these cases, the first responder. But there's a difference between responding and preventing. Shipping companies want to prevent these attacks. Only then will they return to the Red Sea. Unfortunately, that is beyond India's control. So tensions are already high, and the developments in Iran are only making things worse. This week, we saw two bomb explosions. More than 80 people died. A blame game followed. And then last night, a statement was released. It came from the Islamic State. They took responsibility for the attack in Iran. And the statement was detailed. It was released by the ISIS media wing, and it had specified operational details, like who carried out the bombings, how the attack was orchestrated, and even a warning for Iran. The ISIS used two suicide bombers for the attack. They were brothers. Their names have been revealed. Omar al-Muwahid and Saifullah al-Mujahid. They used explosive vests. And the statement ends on a grim note. It threatens more attacks on Iran, which is not surprising, really, because the ISIS has long been an enemy of Iran. It's the Shia-Sunni divide. ISIS is made up of Sunnis. Iran is a Shia state, so there's conflict. But the ISIS sees it not just as a sectarian rivalry, but as a holy war, a war between Shias and Sunnis. They use derogatory terms for Iranians, terms like rejectionists and infidels. In 2019, the ISIS was dismantled in Syria, but not all of their terrorists were eliminated. The group splintered into several smaller groups, and they spread out across the region. Now they operate in a clandestine manner. 
The ISIS has targeted Iran repeatedly. The first attack was in 2017. That's when the group targeted Iran's parliament and the mausoleum of Ayatollah Khomeini, the first supreme leader of Iran. The twin bombings announced the arrival of ISIS. And since then, they haven't left. They've struck Iran repeatedly. Tehran has thwarted many of these attacks, at least a dozen of them over the years. But this week, they failed. Iran did not see it coming. And when the bombs went off, they blamed Israel for it, even the United States. Washington rubbished the charge. It says there is no doubt that this is an ISIS attack. We have seen uh, the public credit now that ISIS-K uh, has taken for the attack uh, in Iran. We're uh, certainly in no position to, to doubt that, uh, that, uh, that claim by, by ISIS-K. After the ISIS statement, the Iranian regime is likely to tone down its rhetoric because at this point, ISIS presents a far bigger challenge. The caliphate may not exist. The numbers may have reduced significantly, but the group is still deadly. They've changed tactics. ISIS leadership is now localized. They operate from the underground. They attack using sleeper cells, so they're difficult to detect and harder to stop. In 2022, the United Nations issued an assessment, an overview of ISIS fighters and their presence in West Asia. And here are the findings. The ISIS still has a foothold on the Iraq-Syria border. How many fighters? 10,000. And that's not all. There are more ISIS factions in the region. The ISIS Khorasan is one of them. It is active along Iran's borders with Afghanistan and Pakistan, the Khorasan province, as it used to be. And what is their strength like? Anywhere between four to 6,000 fighters. The ISIS has a presence in Egypt as well. They're active in the Sinai province with 800 to 1,200 fighters. Also in Libya and Yemen, but the group has a weaker presence there. The attack in Iran could change some of that. It could boost recruitment and embolden existing members to plan more ambitious attacks. So Tehran is doubling down on security, paying more attention to the borders, especially the Afghanistan-Pakistan border. That's their focus. The movement of people is being carefully watched. Tehran could even decide to limit the traffic. Clearly, they're on the edge. Iran wants to contain the ISIS. It cannot afford another escalation. Neither can the region. Explosions are ringing in the other side of Asia as well, in the Korean Peninsula. This is what happened earlier today. North Korea fired 200 artillery rounds towards South Korea, and they landed just off the Yeonpyeong Islands. It's a South Korean island group, barely 12 kilometers away from the North coastline. Pyongyang shells fell close to these islands, and the South Korean military ordered an evacuation. Some 2,000 people live on these islands. They were rushed to bomb shelters. Alerts rang out across South Korea. There was real fear of a war breaking out. The North Korean military fired more than 200 artillery shells from Jangsan Cape, north of Bangyong Island, and Dyongsan Cape, north of Yonpyeong Island, from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. There is no damage to our people and the military, and the shells splashed into the north of the northern limit line. The North Korean shelling stopped after about two hours. Seoul says there were no casualties, but it remains on high alert because these islands have been attacked before. North Korea bombed them back in 2010. Two Marines and two civilians were killed at the time. So South Korea is not taking any chances. After the North stopped its shelling, the South began its own. There are two troops stationed in the Yonpyeong Islands. They conducted live fire exercises. They fired heavy weapons in the direction of the north-south maritime border. It's called the Northern Limit Line. And the South Korean military has shared footage of the drills. It's a clear warning to the North. We sternly warn North Korea that they are fully responsible for this escalation of the crisis, and we strongly urge them to stop it. Our military is tracking and monitoring related situations in close cooperation with the U.S. and South Korea and will implement measures in response to North Korea's provocations. South Korea has name-dropped the U.S. It told Pyongyang that it is coordinating with Washington, but that may not have been the best move. It will only infuriate the North further. And today's shelling was not just a random show of force. It was likely a retaliation. To what? 
the joint U.S. South Korea drills that concluded yesterday. North Korea has been very upset about them, about the U.S. South Korea drills. Their leader Kim Jong Un has been using them as an excuse to prepare for war. This morning, North Korean media released some pictures. Take a look. Kim Jong Un and his daughter, his heir apparent, examining missiles. He said it was important to boost production, to prepare for a military showdown. And then came the news of the North firing 200 artillery rounds. It was no coincidence. Every time there's a drill, there's a North Korean reply. It should be expected by now. But today's tantrum was too close for comfort. The entire region is on edge, even North Korea's big red friend. Under the current situation, we hope that all relevant parties maintain calm and restraint, refrain from taking actions that aggravate tensions, avoid further escalation of the situation, and create conditions for the resumption of meaningful dialogue. Even China understands that today's display was too far, went too far, and this is a country that regularly fires live ammunition around Taiwan. Even they think today was a bit much. It looks like Beijing is trying to calm Kim Jong-un down, which tells you something. The continuous cycle of provocation and response cannot continue. One of these days, those shells will land a bit further south, and then war will erupt on the Korean Peninsula again. And another war is not something that the world can afford right now. We will watch the elections very closely, but of course I would never speculate in advance about what actions we may or may not take in response to any development. It's election time in Bangladesh, the first major election of this year, not the most gripping one though, because the result is obvious. Another victory for Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina. She's been Prime Minister of Bangladesh since the year 2009, and if she wins again, she'll be in power until 2029, which is a long tenure. But why is, his vict is her victory guaranteed? Because the opposition is not contesting. That's the BNP, the Bangladesh Nationalist Party, the opposition party. In fact, they've called for a nationwide strike, a strike that begins tomorrow morning and lasts until Monday, which is after the polling. And what is their demand? Sheikh Hasina's resignation. The BNP wants elections under a caretaker government. They say the ruling party will rig the election. But Sheikh Hasina says, no way. And legally, she's right. Bangladesh has abolished the caretaker system, so the prime minister does not have to resign. Which brings us to present day. The BNP has organized protests across the country. Thousands of their workers are in jail, so the election is basically a no contest. It's Sheikh Hasina versus no one. What do Bangladesh's voters think about that? Listen into some of them. What can I tell about the election? If I cast my vote, Sheikh Hasina will come again. If I don't, Sheikh Hasina will still come. We are happy with the infrastructure the government has developed so far. But the prices of essentials are too high. I don't think it is a competitive election, as the main opposition, BNP, is not participating. In Bangladesh, elections used to be like a festival, full of joy, mics everywhere, BNP here, Awami League there, it was like Eid. But this joy doesn't exist anymore. Voting is on Sunday and the fear is that things could get violent. This morning there was an attack, a school come polling centre was set on fire. It's not clear who was behind the attack. One of the rooms was damaged. Thankfully, the election equipment has not been set up yet. But do you see the problem here? Bangladesh's opposition has a history of street violence. Some of them have radical Islamist roots. They could run riot on polling day, so Dhaka is not taking chances. They have deployed the army across Bangladesh. Soldiers and armored trucks were seen moving through Dhaka. 
The military says it will only act if called upon, if the polling officer sees a problem. So that's the story of Bangladesh's election. No real choice, the opposition on the streets and a high risk of violence. But how should the world see it? Well, Bangladesh is a consequential country. It is home to 170 million people. It's among the largest contributors to the UN peacekeeping forces. And it's a garment powerhouse. Check the labels. Next time you buy something, chances are it was made in Bangladesh. So the elections are very important for the world too, especially for the Indo-Pacific region. You see, Bangladesh has a long Indian Ocean coast more than 500 kilometers long. Dhaka's trusted partner has been India, but recently more players have emerged. China has multiple projects in the country. Russia is building a nuclear power plant. And the US is a top export destination. Around 20% of Bangladesh's garments end up in America. And that could soon be a problem. The US wanted Sheikh Hasina to negotiate with the opposition. They wanted her to make some concessions. Washington says, it is watching this election closely. Afterwards, it may or may not take action. We support a free and fair election in Bangladesh. We have made that uh, quite clear a number of times. Um, we will watch the elections very closely, but of course I would never speculate in advance about what actions we may or may not take in response to any development. Can the US hurt Bangladesh? On paper, yes. They've already sanctioned some Bangladeshi officials. More sanctions could be imposed. But the big worry is the garment industry. What if the US sanctions it? What if it stops buying clothes from Bangladesh? It could be a deadly blow. Garments make up 10% of Bangladesh's GDP. The industry also employs some 4 million people, so sanctions will hurt. It could also affect the geopolitical balance. Both Russia and China have sided with Dhaka. They say, ignore the US. Elections are your internal matter. India, too, has taken the same position. It has refused to take sides in the political standoff, but India has sent election observers. Three officials of the Election Commission of India have reached Dhaka. They are part of the foreign observers team. Officials from the European Union are also present. Frankly, there is little to observe. It's all one-way traffic. So don't expect a nail-biting electoral contest. Bangladesh is not going to be one. But what happens afterwards could be interesting. A forceful US response will push Bangladesh away. It will also put India in a tough spot. So gripping or not, this election matters. In the last two decades, Oscar Pistorius has been called many things. Paralympic champion, blade runner, superman, but only one name has stuck, murderer. In 2013, Oscar Pistorius shot at his girlfriend on Valentine's Day. Three bullets struck her. Minutes later, she was dead. Pistorius says he mistook her for a burglar. In 2014, the court found him guilty. He spent nearly nine years in prison. And now the Blade Runner is out on parole. It's a case that has captured the world's attention. Millions followed the trial every day. He was a hero for South Africa. Within days, he turned into a national villain. So what is it about celebrity murders that intrigues us all? Our next report tells you. It was the early hours of February 14th. Oscar Pistorius was fast asleep. He was at his Pretoria home with his girlfriend, Reva Steenkamp. But suddenly, Pistorius woke up. While he was closing his balcony door, he heard a noise. It came from the bathroom. Pistorius says he screamed, reached out for his gun and then shot at the door, only to realize that it was his girlfriend who was inside. Three bullets hit her. Within minutes, she was dead. This was the story Pistorius told the court. But the prosecution had a different story. They say Pistorius and Steenkamp had an argument. It went on till morning. Steenkamp locked herself in. Pistorius shot at her and killed her. And this is the version the court believed. The trial began in March 2014. By September, Pistorius was found guilty. Today, a decade since killing his girlfriend, he's out on parole. But he can do very little. Movement is restricted and alcohol consumption banned. 
The Pistorius case was the talk of the town when he got sentenced, just like today. So why did it capture global attention? What is it about celebrity murders that transfix us? Well, there are some common elements. The first is a global celebrity and their fall from grace. Pistorius was a famous athlete. When he was 11 months old, his legs were amputated. He used prosthetic legs. And then he beat the odds. He had a successful career on track. First at the Paralympics, where he won multiple medals, and then at the 2012 Olympics, where he ran against able-bodied athletes. People called him the Blade Runner. For South Africa, he was a national hero. So him murdering someone captured everyone's attention. Just like the O.J. Simpson trial. Simpson was an American football hero. He had a solid reputation. And that changed the night he was accused of killing his wife and her friend. The second element is drama. And the Pistorius trial had plenty of it. A sporting hero who overcame everything. A famous girlfriend. Accusations. Crying in the courtroom. Pistorius walking just on his stumps in court. All of that makes for a compelling story. Plus, it was all happening on live TV. It was the first broadcast of a full criminal trial in South Africa. People took time off. Workplaces came to a standstill. Everyone just watched the trial. They were intrigued, like the Gucci murder trial. In 1995, fashion heir Maurizio Gucci was killed by a hitman, one hired by his own wife, Patrizia Reggiani. He wanted to leave her for a younger woman, so Patrizia had him killed. There was fashion, betrayal and a cold-blooded murder, all of which left the public wanting more. And the third element is opinion. When Pistorius went on trial, everyone had an opinion. Good, bad, ugly, nasty, everyone had something to say. Some said he could do no wrong. Others called him a national villain. Many even imagined themselves in his place. Gun violence in South Africa is commonplace and many asked what they would do if they had heard a noise from the bathroom. Plus, it was a simple mystery with just one question. Did Pistorius kill his girlfriend or not? No one knows the real details of that night except Oscar Pistorius. But it's the intrigue that keeps us talking about it even after a decade. In Myanmar, the civil war continues to escalate. By now, the country is used to it, it seems. More than seven decades of non-stop fighting, either the army versus ethnic groups or ethnic groups against each other. So what's different this time? Well, two things are different. One, the army looks weak. And two, the ethnic groups are united. The fighting began in late October. Since then, the rebels have made significant gains. Reports say 50% of the country is in their control. And the army? It's suffering setback after setback. Entire battalions have surrendered without a fight. So the rebels are on the charge. But all this fighting is worrying Myanmar's neighbors, India and China. We'll start with India. Reports say New Delhi wants to secure the Myanmar border, especially basically fence the whole thing up. But there is opposition. Right now, there is free movement at the border, a free movement regime. People can cross the border without a visa. Just one rule. You can't go beyond 16 kilometers. I know it sounds like a strange policy, but there's a reason for it. Hill tribes in the region have families on both sides, in India and in Myanmar. They needed the free movement. So no fences, no visa. Of course, the downside is this. Some 5,000 refugees have come to India since October. Many more could come if the war escalates. It's a tough call to make. The Chief Minister of India's Mizoram state has made his position clear, no fences. That's what he said. Listen to what he told the Prime Minister. I'm quoting, the British had separated the Mizos by carving out Burma from India. That is why we cannot accept the border. So Mizoram is against this border. But Manipur is not. The state of Manipur has been ravaged by ethnic violence since last year. Their Chief Minister wants fences. He thinks it will improve the situation. Like I said, it's not an easy call. That's India's story. Now we come to China. Beijing also has a border with Myanmar. It's more than 2,000 kilometers long. Their fear is the same as India. Refugees and spillover. 
This week, some of those fears came true. Stray shells from Myanmar hit a Chinese border town. Take a look. Beijing has lodged a diplomatic protest. It is asking both sides to stop the fighting. Listen to this. China follows the conflict in northern Myanmar closely and strongly deplores the Chinese casualties caused by the conflict and already lodged serious representations with the relevant parties. China once again asks all parties to the conflict to reach an immediate end to the fighting. This time five people were injured, but what if there are more such incidents? What if the next one is deadlier? That is the worry for China. They may have called for a ceasefire, but chances are the fighting will continue. The rebels have momentum on their side. Today they captured another city, Lao Kaing, on the border with China. And once again, it was a surrender by the Myanmar army. They put down their guns and withdrew. So I guess the obvious question is this. Will the army be defeated? And if so, what comes next? Right now, most of the fighting is in the northeast, in the Shan state. That's where three ethnic groups have ganged up. Elsewhere, the fighting is limited. If that changes, the army may not stand a chance. Again, what happens afterwards? Democracy, elections, prosperity? Maybe not. These ethnic groups have their own fiefdoms. They may have committed to democracy, but their top priority is their own land and power. And how many such groups are there? More than 20. Imagine getting 20 groups to agree on anything. In this, if this conflict is settled on the battlefield, all bets are off. Things could get uglier. But if the junta steps down, there is hope. We could see positive discussions. Surprisingly, that's what India and China have called for. Talks and negotiations. To recline or not to recline, it's a raging debate and it's up in the air right now. At one point, all plain seats had the recline option. You could recline, stretch your legs, crack your back. But now some flights are ditching it. If you fly economy, get ready to sit up straight. Others are modifying it. They're reducing the recline. And why is that? Why are reclining seats vanishing from airplanes? And more importantly, is it okay to recline your plane seat? Our next report tells you. If you've ever traveled on a plane, at the side of your seat, there's a button. You press on it and your seat reclines. But that button does much more than that. It hurts feelings, triggers fights, even causes bruises. So, airlines are ditching it altogether. Ryanair did it in 2004. And in the years to come, some budget airlines followed. There was Allegiant Air and Norwegian. Some have introduced pre-reclined seats like British Airways. These seats come slightly reclined. Others have reduced their recline. It's gone from 4 inches to 2 now. And Finnair has gone one step further. It's ditched recline on a few flights, even in business class. Imagine paying a lot of money only to sleep up straight. But flights aren't doing it for customers. They are doing it for themselves. Any part that moves on a plane is a liability. It can break any time. There's a maintenance cost. So planes are cutting down on that. Plus, without recline, seats are lighter. And flights are always looking at reducing weight. Less weight equals less fuel. It's money saved. It makes sense economically. But does it make sense as a customer? Why is reclining seats so controversial? There are two main reasons. One is space. Modern day flights are getting smaller. And leg space is as imaginary as a unicorn. So everyone needs more of it. The second reason, flight etiquette. This isn't about your right to recline. It's also about the rights of the next passenger. 
planes, after all, are public spaces. So, it's also about the person behind you and their right to a comfortable flight. A mere button has started many seat wars. On a Paris LA flight, a woman prevented the flyer before her from reclining. In another flight, a raging passenger complained about her right to recline. On a Bangkok-Kolkata flight, a reclined seat led to a fight on board. Passengers came to blows. So, does that mean you should never recline? Well, no. Flight attendants say it's okay to recline. You have the right. You do it. But there are some ground rules. It's okay during long-haul flights. No one is expecting you to sit up straight for eight hours. Don't do it during mealtime unless you hate the person behind you and want to drench them in gravy. And lastly, err on the side of caution. Ask the person behind you. If you don't want to ask, at least warn them. It's the least you can do. Empathy can take you a long way, even up in the air. Now let's talk about Nepal. India's external affairs minister is visiting the country. He had a packed schedule. Jayshankar reached Kathmandu yesterday. He held multiple meetings with leaders from across party lines, opposition leaders, former prime ministers, and the current leadership, including Prime Minister Pushp Kamal Dehel, better known as Prachand. Jayshankar did not go empty-handed. He took some gifts to Kathmandu, like a hydropower deal. India will buy more power from Nepal, some 10,000 megawatts over 10 years. It's a lucrative pact for Nepal. They can, they can generate substantial hydropower because they have, they have access to some 6,000 rivers. But their full potential remains untapped. So how much hydropower does Nepal generate today? Less than 3,000 megawatts. And what is the potential? About 42,000 megawatts. Then why can't Nepal generate more power? Well, two reasons, lack of funds and know-how. And now India is stepping up to help. It will buy electricity from Nepal and invest in the power generation sector. India is helping Nepal build more plants. The specifics are still being finalized, but when the plants are ready, they will generate 8,250 megawatts of power. And what's the value of these investments? Billions of dollars, going by one report. During this visit, three cross-border transmission lines were also inaugurated. Kathmandu welcomed the agreement. Before this, India had just a short-term trading deal with them. Nepal wanted a long-term commitment. And the pact was being discussed since last year. Now, both sides have finally signed it. The Nepalese Prime Minister has called it a milestone and a quantum leap for Nepal. And this was not the only deal they signed. The others cover areas like renewable energy, development projects, and space. That's right. Nepal is building a satellite. It's called Munal. India will help them with the launch. And all this was discussed yesterday. Today was day two of the visit. Minister Jayashankar made more announcements. He will extend a new financial package to Nepal to be used for reconstruction efforts. Last year, an earthquake rocked western Nepal. India will help rebuild infrastructure there. The package is worth $75 million. So overall, it was a productive trip. It strengthens India's relationship with Nepal and also sends a message to China. What kind of message? First, India enjoys cross-party support in Nepal. Kathmandu's political landscape is famously unstable. Leaders switch allegiances abruptly and prime ministers change at the drop of a hat. I'll give you an example. Since 2008, no government has managed to complete a full term in Nepal, not a single one. But engagement with India remains a consistent priority for all leaders and parties. During his visit, Minister Jayashankar met with all political stakeholders from across factions, and this underscores India's importance in Nepal's power circles. The second important takeaway is this. Both India and Nepal are working together despite their differences. And there are differences. There's been friction in the past, broadly because of two issues. The first is the boundary issue and the status of three disputed territories, Kalapani, Lipu Lake, and Limpi Yadura, disputed between India and Nepal. The second issue is India's changes to military recruitment and the impact it's had on Gurkha soldiers from Nepal. In the past, they could join the Indian Army, but recently India introduced 
what is called the Agni Pat scheme. It's basically changed the rules for recruitment. And this has affected the Gurkhas. These issues still remain unresolved, but recent engagements have shown that both sides are willing to look beyond them, to focus on mutual benefits and maintain a positive trajectory in the relationship. Now let's shift our focus to Africa, where a scandal has sent the Nigerian government scrambling. The scandal is over fake college degrees from foreign countries. They're apparently being home delivered like pizza. An investigative report came out last week. A Nigerian reporter got his hands on a degree from neighboring Benin. He received a four year undergraduate degree after waiting for just six weeks. The report has caused an uproar in Nigeria and the government is now taking action. On Tuesday, it banned degrees from Benin and Togo. Yesterday, Nigeria announced it would ban degrees from Kenya, Uganda, and Niger as well. And it's not likely to stop there. Here's our report. The Nigerian government is in damage control mode. A new report has put them on the back foot. The investigative journalism report has brought an insidious problem to light. The proliferation of fake foreign college degrees. The investigation was carried out between 2022 and 2023. A reporter bought a fake degree from the neighbouring nation of Benin. It was a four-year bachelor's degree from a university accredited by Nigeria. The reporter received it in just six weeks, without even having to go to Benin. The degree was home delivered. It gets worse. Nigeria has a one-year mandatory military youth programme. Almost every college graduate needs to take part in this. It's a requirement for government jobs and electoral offices, among other things. The reporter used this fake degree from Benin to enrol, and it worked. Despite the degree being fake, despite the reporter actually having done this youth program years ago, he still managed to enrol. This shows that the fake degrees are a viable, fast-track route to employment in Nigeria. And this led to outrage. Nigerians who've done it the right way, people who studied hard for four years to get their degrees, they were furious at this expose. They demanded accountability from their government. And Abuja swung into action. The report came out on the 30th of December. On the 2nd of January, it banned degrees from colleges in Benin and Togo. Both these West African nations are known as hubs for the fake degree trade. But the Nigerian government hasn't stopped there. It plans to widen its net. Colleges in neighbouring Niger will get banned too, and also colleges on the other side of the continent. Nigeria plans to revoke accreditation from universities in Kenya and Uganda as well. A recently released list shows a Ghanaian university on the blacklist. It's also blacklisted the Nigerian campuses of some British and American universities. The crackdown seems thorough, but will this actually fix things? Let's recap. Fake foreign degrees have been a problem for years. Some colleges in Benin and Togo are notorious for this, and they had been banned as recently as 2018. Back then, Cameroon and Ghana were targeted as well. Remember, the investigation took place just four years later in 2022. So clearly, banning did not work. The fake foreign degree scam was up and running again as soon as public attention waned. And there's one important thing to note here. The scam couldn't have returned without help from Nigerian officials, or at the very least, negligence. The colleges offering the fake degrees are accredited by Nigeria. So the investigative reporter's fake degree did pass Nigerian screening. Later, while applying for the mandatory youth service, he had to show proof of his stay in Benin. The degree racketeers got him fake travel documents and passport stamps. So, of course, Nigerian border officials are involved in the scam as well. It shows just how deep the rot goes. The current move to blacklist certain countries is short-sighted. It will hurt honest students. Nigeria needs to focus on finding the corrupt officials at home and plugging the leaks in its verification system and shut down the school for scandal once and for all. Let me begin the last story of this show with a question. Have you heard of the lipstick effect? It's a commonly used phenomenon in economics. Ironically, it was a fashion mogul who came up with it. S.T. Lauder's Leonard Lauder. He said that during economic upheaval, people rein in 
on big spending. Instead, they start spending modest amounts on small indulgences like lipsticks, hence the name, the lipstick effect. It proved true during the Great Depression of 1929. Consumers reduced spending on household goods, but beauty products only took a small hit. We saw this again during the 2008 financial crisis. There was a global economic recession. Companies reported record declines in sales, but sales of premium lipsticks saw an increase. One of the world's leading cosmetic manufacturers, L'Oreal, saw a 5.3% growth in sales that year. As per predictions, history is about to repeat itself. There is a cost of living crisis, prices are soaring, the job market is slowing. 2024 will be the year shoppers finally tighten their belts. So a lipstick economy 2.0 is on the cards. Economists, psychologists, even retailers are betting on it. Except this time, it won't just be lipsticks that will sell out. It will be the little luxuries, meaning the less expensive treats. And they're not limited to beauty. They include flowers, chocolates, perfumes, even croissants from a fancy coffee shop. Basically items that cost relatively less, but give huge returns emotionally. Which kind of explains why sales of alcohol and chocolate skyrocketed during pandemic lockdowns. This is a worldwide phenomenon, but the scale differs. Japanese consumers treat themselves the least. Indians aren't super enthusiastic either, but little luxury binging is common in countries like America, Sweden, Canada and Australia, and men splurge as much as women. In fact, they shell out 40% more money. Little luxuries have become a TikTok sensation too, thanks to the treat yourself trend. Gen Z takes this concept quite seriously, treating themselves. Retailers are also happy to oblige. They put pricey lip balms and candies on payment counters or introduce luxury feeling products, but at an affordable price. Retailing giant Target did this recently. It introduced a curated section called Affordable Joy, which offers self-care cosmetic products. But the question still remains, why do people gravitate towards little luxuries? According to economics, there are things consumers find necessary, like basic food and clothes. Then there are things which we consider affordable luxuries, the pretty little things that make, make us happy. During prolonged economic uncertainty, people become budget conscious. They move away from high-priced purchases, like buying homes or cars or electronics. But they don't stop buying things. They simply get the luxury they can afford. Shoppers want retail therapy, without breaking the bank. And psychologists know why. You see, inflation doesn't just deflate people's spending power, but also their spirits. A small shopping spree feels good. Research says it can boost your mood, like a small win would. When times are tough, it can also help people celebrate better, kind of why people shop the most during January and February. They're simply indulging in a very long New Year's party. So there's a dark side to all of this as well. People tend to buy more than they need or take on debt to buy luxury they cannot really afford. So the key is to tread lightly. And if done right, little luxury has big benefits, not just for you, but also for the economy. And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. In Germany, angry farmers blocked the economy minister on a ferry over tax breaks. In Bolivia, police officers are required to exercise every day to improve physical fitness. And New Zealand's youngest MP performs the native war cry in Parliament. Finally, we're taking you back in history. On this day in 1933, construction began on the Golden Gate Bridge. It was open to public four years later. At the time, it was the longest bridge bridge span in the world. The bridge has since become one of the most famous American landmarks. We're leaving you on that note. Thank you for watching. Have a great weekend.
Come on, come on, come on.